Hello and welcome to North Shore Fellowship's online service. We are glad that you have tuned in. If you're watching on Facebook, would you click the like and share buttons? And if you're watching on YouTube, would you share the link with friends? One way or another, would you tell others what we are doing here at North Shore Fellowship and let it all be for God's glory? Let's pray together over today's service. Father, we thank you for this. We thank you for this moment in time where we can turn our attention to your teaching, where we can turn our hearts to be right with you, to worship you, to lean into your purposes for today and your purposes over our lives. We ask you to draw us in and let this be a blessed time. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship.
Friends, we are continuing our series, Faithful Regardless, and this is a study of the book of 1 Samuel. Now, last week, we started to see Saul, King Saul, the first king of Israel, start to unravel. His demise is pretty apparent right now. It's very sad. Uh, he's making bad decisions. He's becoming increasingly more disobedient to the Lord, and it's becoming increasingly more consequential to his reign and also to the nation of Israel. You know, and it's sad because at one point, Saul was filled with the Holy Spirit, he started out doing fantastic, but as he became king, he became more and more self-reliant and he started to do things that were only according to his own understanding and his own agenda instead of God's wisdom and God's will. And so finally, uh, Saul asked God, shall I go down and pursue the Philistines and will you give them into Israel's hands? This is after a lot of disobedience and he's asking God to direct him and to empower him. And verse 37 of chapter 14 says this, God's answer was nothing. God did not answer him at all on that day. God became silent to Saul. Now here we go with the next chapter and he is starting to realize that he's getting one last chance. He was already disbanded. He was already told by Samuel that the kingdom was being ripped from him and given to someone else. But it seems as though God is giving him a last chance, and it's the Amalekites, Saul and the Amalekites. One last chance to pr prove himself, maybe even redeem his reign as king, maybe even to get redeemed and forgiven and restored. Who knows what God had in mind, but he gave him a very important task, and that was to go out and destroy the Amalekites once and for all, destroy these evil Amalekites who have been Israel's ancient enemy from the time they left Egypt. Now, the Amalekites, when they show up, they're always evil and they're always doing mass murder towards the Israelites. In fact, they brutally attacked the Israelites when they were leaving Egypt. This is when Pharaoh finally let them go. Moses led them through the wilderness. And who showed up? The Amalekites. As they were pounding away at the tail end of that caravan of Israel, which at that time was just ex-slaves, a nation of weak and homeless ex-slaves. And the ones in the back, usually the women and the children and the sick, as the millions would march across the desert, the Malachites would attack them. In fact, in Deuteronomy 25, 17 and through 19, it says this, Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt, when you were weary and worn out. They met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. This is typically women and children. They had no fear of God. When the Lord God gives you rest from your enemies all around you in the land he's giving to you to possess as an inheritance, you shall blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Do not forget. So Moses and the children of Israel were charged with this task and they never did it. They never completely blotted out Amalek or the Amalekites. Now, the Amalekites continued to thrive and they later joined with the Canaanites and the Moabites and the Midianites all to wage war on Israel. Sometimes they're responsible for com complete destruction of colonies. Uh, sometimes they would just destroy their land or their food supply, but they were always intent on killing God's people. And so Samuel gives Saul one more task, and that is to do what neither Joshua nor Moses nor anyone that came before was able to do, and that's to completely destroy the evil Amalekites. So we turn to 1 Samuel 15, and we'll start with verse 1. Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to I Samuel said to Saul, I am the one the Lord sent to anoint you king over his people Israel. So listen now to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will punish the Amalekites for what they did to Israel when they waylaid them as they came up from Egypt. Now go attack the Amalekites and totally destroy all that belongs to them. Do not spare them. Put to death men and women, children, infants, cattle, sheep, camels, and donkeys. So Saul summoned the men and mustered them at Talim, 200,000 foot soldiers and 10,000 from Judah. Saul went to the city of Amalek and set an ambush in the ravine. And then he said to the Kenites, go away, leave the Amalekites so I do not destroy you along with them. For you showed kindness to all of the Israelites when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites moved away from the Amalekites. And then Saul attacked the Amalekites all the way from Havilah to Shur, near the eastern border of Egypt. He took Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and all his people he totally destroyed with the sword. 
But Saul and the army spared Agag and the best of the sheep and cattle, the fat calves and lamb, and everything that was good. These they were unwilling to destroy completely, but everything that was despised and weak, they totally destroyed. And then the word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king because he has turned away from me and has not carried out my instructions. Samuel was angry and he cried out to the Lord all that night. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul. But he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's instructions. But Samuel said, what then is this bleating of sheep in my ears? What is this lowing of cattle that I hear? Pause right there. Saul did not completely destroy the Amalekites and all of their animals. He saved the best animals. He saved their king to torment and whatever else. Who knows if there was others. And as Samuel approached, Saul's first words were, hey, glad to see you. I want you to know I completely obeyed and carried out the Lord's instructions. And meanwhile, as he's saying that, that he destroyed all the animals and all the people, he hears in the background, bah, moo, moo, bah, all kinds of farm animals, sheep and cattle. And then that's when Saul says, Samuel says, well, if you did all that, what is this lowing of cattle and bleeding of sheep in my ears? Saul answered, oh, that. Oh. He says in verse 15, the soldiers brought them from the Amalekites. They spared the best of the sheep and cattle to, to sacrifice to the Lord your God. See, but we totally destroyed the rest. Enough, Samuel said to Saul. Let me tell you what the Lord has said to me last night. Tell me, Saul replied. Samuel said, although you were once small in your own eyes, did you not become the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. He sent you on a mission saying, go and completely destroy those wicked people, the Amalekites. Wage war against them until you have wiped them out. Why did you not obey the Lord? Why did you not pounce on the, why did you pounce on the plunder and do evil in the eyes of the Lord? But I did. Obey the Lord, Saul says. I went on the mission the Lord assigned me. I completely destroyed the Amalekites and brought back Agag, their king. The soldiers took the sheep and cattle from the plunder, the best of what was devoted to God, in order to sacrifice them to the Lord your God at Gilgal. But Samuel replied, Does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice. And to heed is better than the fat of rams. For rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. We'll pause right there. I know this is a really long and exciting passage because of what's going on. Saul is not owning up to the fact that he did not completely obey God's command. Now this is after God had given him a few other tasks and a few other tests to prove that he should be king. And Saul failed those and he also failed this one. And instead of saying, I failed, instead of asking for forgiveness for, for not obeying the word of the Lord, he blamed the men on not destroying the cattle. And then he said, but it's okay because you know what we'll do? We'll just sacrifice them to the Lord and everything will be okay. And that's why Samuel responds very affirmatively, to obey is better than sacrifice. Don't just go and do your own thing and then say, okay, well, I did my own thing. I did, I achieved my own agenda. And now let's just do a little of the God stuff and everything will even out. To obey is better than sacrifice. Rebellion is like the sin of divination and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. And that's when Saul, Samuel says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Ooh. Well, then Samuel, I'm sorry, then Saul changes his story. He starts blaming his men and he changes it. And he says, sent to Samuel, I have sinned. I violated the Lord's command and your instructions, but I was afraid of the man, men, so I gave in to them. Now I be beg you, forgive my sin and come back to me that I may worship the Lord. But Samuel said to him, I will not go back to you. You have rejected the word of the Lord and the Lord has rejected you as king over Israel. 
So basically he was fired and now he's begging for his job back. And as Samuel turned to leave, Saul caught the hem of his robe and, he, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to one of your neighbors, to one better than you. He who is the glory of Israel does not lie or change his mind, for he is not a human being that he should change his mind. And Saul replied, I have sinned, but please honor me before my elders and the people and before Israel. Come back with me so I may worship the Lord your God. So Samuel went back with Saul and Saul worshiped the Lord. But then Saul, Samuel said, bring me Agag, king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him in chains and he thought, surely the bitterness of death is past. Pause right there. This is kind of a very sad, but little strain of humor because Agag, the king of the Amalekites, was spared. And I don't know if he is cohorting with the men or if he's getting along just fine, but he, he is um, kind of rejoicing and celebrating. He's, and he's being brought to Samuel. He's saying, wow, this is great. Surely the bitterness of death is past. We got all that behind us. Now let's, uh, let's party. But Samuel said, as your sword has made women childless, so will your mother be childless among women. And Samuel put Agag to death before the Lord at Gilgal. Ooh, okay. Now, I know this for some, and for me, in the past has been a very disturbing read. You know, God told his people, Saul, to go and kill all the Amalekites, and that includes the women and children and the animals, to kill them all, to wipe them out. And then you have this king who was spared, and instead of Samuel forgiving him or whatever it might be, he Samuel said, well, Saul didn't kill you, but I will kill you myself. And he did. And so it's hard for us to fathom this, especially in modern times. But apparently, according to God's word, this is what needed to be done. Now, remember, God is just. Everything he does is right. And we also have to remember that his ways are higher than ours and his thoughts are wiser. See, we don't always understand why God asks us what to do. And in this case, in the Old Testament, deep into the Old Testament, to completely wipe out an entire people group, a genocide, if you will. Why would God do that? Well, God knows. Maybe we don't know. But who knows? Perhaps this generation of Amalekites would become even worse and worse, increasing, increasing evil, and maybe more horrific mass murderers than those that went before. Maybe if they continued, they would have wiped out millions, maybe billions of people through history in the coming ages. You know, one of them, an Amalekite that obviously didn't get destroyed, became Haman, the evil Haman, in the book of Esther that tried to destroy all the Jews. And Queen Esther... Uh, uh, appealed to the king. Haman was Am Am from Amalek, Amalekite. And also, this is really important. When we're studying things in the Old Testament that we don't fully understand, that we remember this, is that Jesus came and completely changed the way God deals with and relates to mankind. And Jesus dying on the cross and his resurrection were not just some, you know, sideline accessory to the story of God but they are central, central. So God, God's dealings with sin and with mankind are completely different now that Jesus has come. Now, we don't ever see this in the New Testament. We never see God tell the apostles, go kill all the Romans and all the Pharisees. It just doesn't happen. Jesus changed and fulfilled much of what we're reading in the Old Testament. Verse 34, then Samuel left for Ramah. But Saul went to his home in Gibeah of Saul. They parted ways. And until that day, until the day Samuel died, he did not go see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And this is what happened. The Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. A very sad ending to this relationship. Samuel mourned, legitimately mourned for Saul even though he would not see him again. In fact, the next chapter opens up with Samuel mourning for, for Saul. And it's clear that Saul would never become the leader that Israel needed as their king and that God had already selected someone else, someone who would take his place and will meet him in the next chapter. And Saul felt that he could disregard God's word and turn his back on the Lord's commands. 
and then he would just make up for it by sacrifice, but the Lord would not have it. God showed him very clearly that this was not acceptable. Remember, to obey is better than sacrifice. And so we have to take this and say, what about us? Now, I believe this, that God is seeking men and women whom he could put into places of power and influence to carry out his plans and his purposes here on earth. Men and women he can trust to implement his will for the world. Uh, That's what we do when we carry the gospel. That's what we do when we're infused with the word of God and we speak it and we live it. God is entrusting us with that. But I want to tell you what he's looking for. He's looking for obedience, not obstinance. He's looking for humility, not just ability. He's looking for integrity over intelligence. And he's looking for submission and not self-importance. I believe that Saul failed on all these fronts. Saul showed over and over again that he was driven by pride and by arrogance. His own agenda, his own self-image were way more important than the will of God. And even God's instructions that were clearly given to him, he disregarded and went about things his own way. Time and time again, he disregarded the word of God, prioritizing his own selfish pursuits. In fact, he was comfortable operating outside God's will and leading other people to do that uh, as well, like his men, until he got caught. And then once he got caught, well, then he groveled for mercy. But if you you read what he's saying when he's trying to to plead for mercy, he's saying, I I want to have my own self-preservation. I want to be raised up again in the eyes of the elders and of Israel. This is not because he wanted to honor God, not to seek him with his own heart, his whole heart. Saul was only concerned with himself and not God. And just even though God gave him another chance to honor him, he blew it once again. And that judgment upon him from chapter 13, it still stood here in this chapter. You know, it said, but now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people because you have not kept the Lord's commands. That's 1 Samuel 13, 14. He was told early on that it was being ripped from him and that it was being given to another. And yet he carried on, he continued to carry on the way he had been all along. And God had already identified David, already had his eyes on David. And he called him a man after God's own heart. A man after God's own heart. Wow. The heart, part of our soul, right? Our mind and emotions that connects with God. David, very uniquely, was after God's heart. He wanted to connect to him on a, with him on a heart level. Heart is the very essence of who we are, our utmost priorities and passions, our heart. And David wholeheartedly sought the Lord. His life was a vivid example of pursuing God and being faithful regardless. And we're going to study David in the, in the uh, weeks to come. And, and, you know, it's interesting. Even when David willfully failed, willfully entered into very serious sin, and we'll see that, in fact, the day, I believe David's sin, on my, in my opinion, was way worse than Saul's sins. Saul's sins of, of, you know, not waiting for Samuel to show up, even though he did wait seven days. Saul's sin of not killing all the Amalekites, even though he wiped out them almost completely. And other things, David's sin was having a man killed so he could steal his wife. <laughs> but when, when David wanted to be forgiven. He didn't, like Saul, grovel for his own self-preservation and reputation. When David was confronted with his sin, he was grieved in his heart. He pleaded to be restored to heart fellowship with the Lord. Psalm 51 is all about that. We'll read a couple verses. Psalm 51, 4 says, Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. In verse 10 and 11, he says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. You see, David was pleading not to be away from God. All he wanted was God. He felt the grievance of being separated by this sin. He wanted a clean heart. He recognized that he had sinned before God and it grieved him to his very core, his very 
heart. Not Saul. Saul said, oops, let's throw a sacrifice up there and, and restore me so my reputation is maintained. David's heart was deeply grieved because of sin. And Saul only felt bad because he got caught and his position was taken away. There's a big difference between those two. You see, God deeply desires a wholehearted relationship with us. He's not satisfied with those who simply just go through the motions and hold positions of influence and have no real care for God or his heart. In fact, Jesus encountered many religious people like this, the Pharisees and others, simply not seeking after God's heart, even though they were in charge of representing God to the people, teaching God to the people, telling people what God is like. That was their job. Yet many of these Pharisees had no relationship with God and they didn't even care about it. They didn't care. You know, I often come across people, religious leaders sometimes, and it makes me wonder if they truly seek after God's heart. Things about their ministry, their private life, um, sometimes it just seems like a position with empty words and symbolism and tokenism. And sometimes it's, you know, it's not just the religious robed liturgical clerics. I'm talking about contemporary worship and teaching pastors. And, and I just come away wondering, do they love the Lord with all your heart? Now, listen, I hate to be judgmental. I really do, I, especially to pastors and people in ministry, because I know how hard it is. I, I have a lot of empathy for pastors, even pastors I don't agree with on you know, certain items and issues. I, I, I have a lot of empathy for them, those who have given their life and their family's life to ministry. Um, it's a hard life. But I want to say, sometimes it just doesn't seem like their passion and love for God is apparent. And I, I wonder, doesn't that bother them? Because I think it should. And it should bother, bother all of us, not just leader, leaders. It should bother us when our heart is not touched by the Lord and we're not re responding to him wholeheartedly. We don't have a heart after God. And it's just kind of making sure we do the right things and don't do the, the wrong things. And we're okay. That's not what God is seeking. He's seeking men and women from all over the world who have a heart after him so he could raise them up and empower them. <clears throat> Second Chronicles 16, 9 says this, for the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. In other words, people who have a heart after God. What does it mean to have a heart after God? Chuck Swindle is tremendous author and teacher and he writes this having a heart after god it means your life is in harmony with the lord what is important to him is important to you what burdens him burdens you and when he says go to the right you go to the right when he says stop that in your life you just stop it and when he says this is wrong and i want to change you come to terms with it because you have a heart after god remember to obey is better than sacrifice God wants us to have a heart after him and to, and, and to show, have lives that show that because the things in our life that separate us from him, like sin and things like that, the things that cause us to be distant and our relationship to, with him to be constricted, we hate those things. We legitimately hate those things. Even Paul says, I do the very thing I don't want, I, I hate really. And the very thing I love, I don't do. And he's, he's bothered by it in Romans 7 because he has a heart after God. Keith Green had a very convicting song about this. To obey is better than sacrifice. You know, guys, obedience from a heart towards God is what God is seeking for. That's what you're, when your heart is completely his. Now, I'm not just talking about adherence. The Pharisees did that. I'm not just talking about fulfilling all the commandments and obeying all the laws so that you can say that you're clean or you're better than someone else, holier than thou. The Pharisees did that. I'm talking about loving God so much that the things that separate you from him grieve you. That's where David was at. When Jesus was asked what the greatest commandment was, he said this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Matthew 22, 37, Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. And this is nothing new. Jesus was simply quoting Moses from Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy 6, 5, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. In fact, this quote is, is a very common quote in synagogues throughout the world. It comes right after the Shema 
you know, hero Israel, the Lord your God is one. But there's a, a prayer called the Ve'ahavta. And it's about loving God with your heart. It says this, Ve'ahavta et Adonai Elochecha Bechol Labavcha. And that is, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. God wants you to love him with all your heart. God's seeking people to carry out his plans and purposes. Men and women who he can trust to implement his will in the world. Remember what we said? People who are obedient, not obstinate. People who show humility, not just ability. People who have integrity, not just intelligence. People who are submitted to his will and not into their own thing, self-importance. He's really seeking those, not just to obey him, but to honor him, to serve him and love him with all their hearts. So let's do that. Let's love him in all that we do and all that we say and how we live. And let's just not do it because of rote and because of obligation. Let's do it because we want to love him with all our hearts. And let it be said of you and me and us. Let it be said of us that we are people after God's own heart. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor Raphael. Well, good morning. Great to be with you. As you can see, it's still summertime. The weather is great, and we have a lot of events still on our calendar, so let's go through them and see what we have coming up. On Tuesdays, we have the Seabright Beach Outreach. We're going to do it four more times, four more Tuesdays left to go. Worship, teaching, and fellowship. It all starts at 6.30 p.m. Seabright Public Beach, right by the big firehouse. Very easy to find us. Remember, it's an outdoor event, so if there's any questions about the weather, you go to our Facebook page or you go to our website for the latest information. Saturdays, we have great teaching going on down at Ocean Grove. Uh, we have the Ocean Grove Boardwalk Worship Service. Now, this is for the next two Saturdays, left in August here. Begins at 6 p.m. It's held at the Ocean Grove Pavilion right on the boardwalk, and it's taught by our own Pastor Raphael. Various worship teams will be there, but if you're looking to get out on a Saturday, come on out, enjoy the beach, and swing over to the pavilion at 6 for some great teaching. For the guys, third Saturday of the month is coming up for the Men's Monthly Fellowship, 8 o'clock in the morning. On Saturday, August the 21st, that's this coming Saturday, our guest speaker is Len Gademi. We'll be at the Peninsula location. We will be outside. So guys, do bring a chair because we sit on the lawn. It's a wonderful time of fellowship. It's very friendly for the younger guys. So bring them on out. Love to see you there on this coming Saturday. Well, we have our Fun Maker Factory Vacation Bible School coming up in just two weeks. It's going to run Sunday, August the 29th through Wednesday, September the 1st. It will begin on our regular Sunday services, 9 a.m. in Peninsula and 11 at Bellworks. Uh, and then goes for the next three days, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday from 6 to 8 p.m. On Monday, it'll be at Peninsula. On Tuesday, it will be at the Seabright Beach. And on Wednesday, it will be at Homedell Park. So you have a lot of variability as to the times and the places. Love to see you come out for all of it. But if you can come out for part of it, that's great too. We do have a website for you. You can go on there and get information. You can register your kids. You can even volunteer to help if you're moved that way. Uh, it's a wonderful time. We hope that you'll share this invite with family and friends. Love to see you come out for Vacation Bible School. Well, as you can see, with all the things that are going on, and there's more that I can't even get into on this broadcast because there just isn't that much time, we are really looking to expand our ministry teams. We're looking for help with the graphics that we put up during service, the handling of the kids in the nursery area, uh, teaching the kids uh, in, the, in their ministry, um, working with setup and takedown, greeting and ushering. If you have a talent, everybody does, we would love to have it. Your contact for this is Melissa. You contact her at her email address. Speaking of email, we have an email list that we'd love to be able to send you. It comes out a couple times a week, keep you completely informed. Send your information to us at info at northshorenj.org. We'll put it all right in your inbox for you. Regular events that go on, Wednesday, Worship in the Word, 7 p.m., Facebook and YouTube Live, recently been broadcasting out of Ocean Grove. Regular Sunday services, Peninsula service at 9 a.m., and the later service at 11 a.m. at the Bellworks building in Homedale. And of course, for all of our online friends, our online services are 9 and 10.30 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube Premiere. Hey, 
We very much covet your prayers in support of all that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. We also invite you to come and participate with us financially. Go to our website, pull down on the menu, you'll find the word give, follow the very simple instructions, and your financial gift can come in and help support. We do, of course, thank all of you who have been faithful in your tithes and offerings and in support of the mission and work that goes on here at North Shore Fellowship. Would you join me in prayer over this offering? Dear Lord, we come before you thankful and happy that we can come and just thank you for all that you give and all that you provide. Father, we thank you that you give with such abundance that there's a portion that we can give back to you that we can put toward your work and your word going forward in this area. So, Father, we ask that you would bless this offering, that you would multiply it, that you would direct it, that you would be pleased with all that we do with it. So, Father, be in the work, prepare us for it, guide our hearts and minds. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey, so, like I was saying, it's a hot summer, the weather is still great, and it is not over yet. So look at your calendar, see what we have going on. Come on out and enjoy. We would love to see you in person. Have a terrific week, and may God bless you all.
Thank you, friends, for being with us at North Shore Fellowship Online. I hope that you were able to worship the Lord today with us. I hope that you were able to hear from God through his word. And if God is tugging at your heart, it may be that you need to give your heart to Jesus. If you've never fully given your heart to Jesus, today is the day for that. And we'd be glad to lead you in a very simple prayer, a prayer of commitment that will completely change your life and change your heart. So reach out to us for that. Otherwise. Let's get together. You know, there's so many things still happening throughout the summer. This is a great time for us to gather places other than online. And I want to challenge you to do that if you're able to. Otherwise, we'll see you online every Sunday, every Wednesday. And stay connected. Tell us if we can pray for you. Reach out to us. Let us know you're there. God bless you and have a fantastic day.